period of the military regime from Brazil and from the United States. Um, many, many activities took place uh, in the last two weeks in Brazil, and a series of other international activities will be taking place throughout this year as people mark the 50th anniversary of the coup and its implications uh, for the country over the subsequent 50 years. And uh, the person that I clearly wanted to come to give the keynote was Carlos Fico, who is, I think, one of the most important scholars of Brazilian history today. He has written incredibly important, path-breaking books on the history of the dictatorship. Um, I'm only going to mention a few, but the most important first book on this topic was Reinventando o Optimismo, Dictadora Propaganda Imaginária no Brasil, 69-77, Reinventing Optimism, Dictatorship, Propaganda, and Imagination of the Imaginary in Brazil from 69 to 77, which is a brilliant analysis of the propaganda machine created during the Medici government and the way it mobilized popular opinion in Brazil. He also produced an outstanding book based on his research at the National <coughs> Archive on special documents that were deposited there, uh, Como Eles Agiam os, os Subterrâneos da Ditadura Militar, How They Operated the sub, uh, sub Subterrâneos, you know what that means, uh, of the dictatorship, <laughs> underground of the dictatorship which is a wonderful analysis of the logic of the repressive apparatuses, documentation, and uh, archival uh, work of the repressive forces and the propaganda machine of the military dictatorship. He has edited several edited collections, including Além do Golpe, Versões e Controversas sobre 64 e a Dictadura Militar, which is uh, an edited collection uh, beyond the coup, versions and controversies about 1964 and the military <coughs> dictatorship. And for those of you who know um, and are interested in the historiography of 64, you need to read this book because it's a brilliant historiographic essay about different interpretations of the military regime. And then what I consider just one of the best books uh, about uh, 1964 to 85, O Grande Irmão, da Operação Brother Sam, Ausano do Chumbo. Uh, the, bear bro the big brother from Operation Brother Sam to the leaden years of the years of the latter, the period of the repression and the dictatorship. Carlos Fico is a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He has also served this last year as the evaluator of the National uh, Graduate School, uh, Graduate Educational Systems Evaluation of History Department uh, programs throughout Brazil, which meant he was traveling, uh, I think he was in airplanes, uh, more than he was anywhere else through that last year, and therefore was very reluctant to accept an invitation to come to the United States. And then I was shocked to find out that his connection flight was arriving at 7.30 this morning somewhere in North Carolina and then doing a seven-hour layover. Um, I was concerned that he would get here on time, and he did, and I'm very thankful for that for our, for our event. We're going to have um, an uh, opening lecture by uh, Professor Fico. He's asked because of uh, the, the, the weight of the travel, that he will not entertain questions afterward. We'll, we're going to then move immediately into our reception. But there will be two days of operation, uh, opportunities to, uh, to talk with, uh, with him and the other members of the symposium uh, tomorrow and on Saturday. So without further ado, I'd like to call Professor Carlos Fico to the, to the podium. Well, do you want to end this? Do you want the app, this out of the way? Let's do the symposium. Okay, we'll just do this one second. Could you put the symposium up? I don't know. Yeah. Just the image of the symposium. Well, dear colleagues, I'd like to thank you for welcoming me here in this symposium. I especially thank the invitation and kind words of my dear friend James Green, whose political and academic career I admire a lot. I'm coming straight from the airport, so I, 
I also want to thank Jimmy for giving me the opportunity of a whole new experience today. I will make my first lecture under jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really thrilled. Um, first, I'd like to apologize for my strong accent. I will read at a slow pace so that hopefully you won't have much trouble understanding me. I'm following all the exciting program of this symposium. And so I suppose we may, during the Friday and Saturday panels, discuss the issues I wish to present now. The theme proposed by the symposium, by relating the 1964 coup d'etat in our present day, is very opportune. In fact, I accepted the invitation to be here today precisely because of this theme. I had decided not to participate in any talks, seminar, or conference in this 50th anniversary of the coup, because I think there is not much that's new in historiographical terms about 1964. In the past 10 years, historical research has certainly advanced, but it has not come to alter dramatically anything you already said in the countless academic events that marked the coup's 40 years in 2004. Insofar as I had no significant revelation, I decided to write a small book intended for the general public, not for the academy, to mark the 50 years of the coup. Brazilian society, at least those who are called the public opinions, is nowadays reasonably interested in themes concerning the military dictatorship. This is a meaningful change. I remember that on the occasion of the coup's 30 years, few got interested in the theme. This change in 2004, the coup's 40 years, and the interest has kept growing until today. Why and how this come about? This is the central issue of my, new, my newly published book, and this is also why I would like to talk about today. I would like you to consider and reflect upon two points I have insisted on making. The first concerns the importance inherent in the 1964 coup, that is, it was not just the opening event of the military dictatorship, as it has usually been seen by historiography. The second point is a kind of corollary. If we interpret the coup just as the opening event of the dictatorship, we will not be able to understand what is going on in Brazilian society today. I'm going to try to clarify what I'm proposing. The 1964 coup d'etat is the key event of the recent history of Brazil. We can hardly understand the present day country without considering the true extent of that decisive moment. <coughs> it set into motion a military regime that would last 21 years, but on March 31st, 1964, when President João Goulart was deposed, no one knew that. The coup did not presuppose necessarily the dictatorship that followed. Allow me to repeat and emphasize this point, which seems to me essential. When the coup took place, there was not the perception that it would become the opening event of the dictatorship. Today, however, most analysis interpreted it so as the first event of the military regime. And because of this interpretation, they reduce its significance and block a more refined understanding of the historical agents and process involved in, in it at that time. Therefore, I'm arguing that 
there was a process, a development, which, so to say, transformed the coup into a dictatorship. How did the coup become a dictatorship? Many people who supported it came to regret their position as time went by. As a matter of fact, those who support the coup, such as the press, the Catholic Church, and vast sectors of the urban middle class, were not few at all. Institutions that years later would become strong opponents of the regime, such as the Brazilian Bar Association, the Brazilian Press Association, or the National Conference of Bishops of Brazil, had dubious attitudes, to say the least, at that time. Therefore, it's necessary to keep in mind that the coup was not the initiative of disturbed militaries who decided, out of the blue, to charge against the constitutional regime and the legitimate <coughs> president of Brazil. Society gave them its support. I believe these preliminary considerations are important. Very often, when we study the military dictatorship, as I have done for so many years, we tend to regard the 1964 coup just as its opening event, but it was more than that. It represented the more contemporary manifestation of the persistent Brazilian authoritarianism, which had already expressed itself on so many other occasions, such as the other authoritarian republican regime, the Estado Novo. So maybe the essential question to be asked is, why so many supported it? Instead of merely asking ourselves, how did the military dictatorship begin? That is, the question that imposes itself for me is the following. How far did the Brazilian society accept, or does it still, it still accept authoritarian formulas for the resolution of its conflicts? If this is a legitimate question, it can only be answered if we reject the idea that the 1964 coup was the beginning of a process of victimization that would have established on the one side a democratic society and on the other the coup leaders, especially the military, as authoritarians it is necessary to overcome the simplified reading. As you all know, historical phenomena are complex. There are no simple facts. The good historical understanding is not comforting or soothing. It does not redress the past, nor does it give us definite answers, but it makes us think. When it comes to the support given by society to the 1964 coup, for example, there are difficulties. If, on the one hand, the press, the Catholic Church, and part of the middle class, as well as businessmen, supported Goulart's deposition, there are, on the other, reliable surveys which show that society supported the president. <laughs> According to the respected public opinion polls, <coughs> Instituto Ibope, on the eve of the coup, Goulart enjoyed popular support. The institute donated its archives <coughs> of that time to Campinas University, and historian Luis Antonio Dias has worked with this material. According to him, Goulart had great chances of being reelected in case he would have run for the 1965 presidential elections. More than half of the voters said they intended to vote for him in most of the capital cities surveyed. He only lost to the pop 
popular former president Juscelino Kubitschek in two cities, Belo Horizonte and Fortaleza. This confirms that the destabilization campaign of which the president was a victim and that generated massive political propaganda was not efficient and not even enough for Jango's deposition, an aspect that deserves to be well considered because almost all historiography attributes the size of the weight to the political propaganda prior to the coup which aimed at destabilizing João Goulart's government. There is a conceptual debate which help us, helps understand the nature or character of the 1964 coup, when fought off in isolation without considering what came afterwards. I refer to those who adopt the expression military coup and those who, more recently, prefer civil military coup. Several researchers of the 1964 coup and the historical period that followed it have insisted on refuting the phrases military coup and military dictatorship for the more correct name it would be civil military coup and dictatorship. Their preoccupation is praiseworthy <coughs> for it views exactly the fact that there was civil support to the coup and the regime. I would defend, however, a point of view that is slightly different. It's not the political support that determines the nature of events in history, but the effective participation of the historical agents in their configuration. In this sense, it is right to name the 1964 coup d'etat a civil military. Besides the support of large parts of society, it was effectively, effectively carried out by civil agents as well. Governors, congressmen, Brazilian civil leaders, and even the government of the United States of America were effective plotters and initiators. Nevertheless, the subsequent regime was eminently military, and many of the civil agents who took part in the coup were soon driven away by the military for fear they would jeopardize their rule. It is true that there was also support of part of society to the dictatorship after the coup, as was the case during the period of great economic growth known as the Brazilian miracle. But, as I mentioned before, it does not seem to me that uh, mere political support can define the nature of an event. It's much more correct to consider the role historical subjects play in its effectuation. Thus, I admit as right the expression civil military coup, but what came after it was undisputedly a military dictatorship. There is also disagreement as to the nature of the coup between those who see it as the climax of a process that had been ripening for a long time and those who argue that the coup was essentially a response of the military and of business people to a situation immediately prior to it. Among the first are the analysts who call attention to structural aspects of long duration. It is, for instance, the case of those who suppose the coup realized, um, resulted, I'm sorry, the coup resulted from the need to alter the political frame at that stage of Brazilian capitalism. New sectors of the bourgeoisie 
linked to the mutual capitalism would have found in the 1964 coup the appropriate vehicle for obtaining voice at government level. In the case of those who assign value to the situation immediately prior to the coup, there is the train that argues that in 1964 what happened was a preventive counter-coup to avoid Goulart's coup. Here, there is something curious. Almost all militaries defend this thesis, but at least one Marxist historian, the autodidact Jacob Gorende, founder of the Revolutionary Communist Party in Brazil, of Brazil, holds something similar. According to him, the coup leaders had many reasons to act before things go out of hand, since, for Gorender, the social dynamic previous to the coup was frank, frankly revolutionary. I, I quote, the highest point in the Brazilian works struggle in the 20th century, unquote. As we all know, the debate about the denomination of historical events is never superfluous, and in general, is a symptom of something more profound. The civil military denomination calls attention to the fact that there was civil support to and participation in João Goulart's overthrow. The idea of a preventive counter coup suggests some kind of offensive coming from the left. What could be the coup's striking feature? What aspect or analytical vector should we value the coup leaders, society? There is not much doubt that militaries and business people sponsored the coup. But the role of the middle class in popular sectors must yet be clarified. Was there a revolutionary dynamic, as Gorender argues? In this case, why was the victory of the coup leader so overwhelming since very few popular protests and no effective resistance motions were recorded? On the other hand, how are, we to, how are we to explain that Goulart counted on relative popular support, as can be seen from the already mentioned surveys, and at the same time that such significant sections of the public opinion and the middle class supported his overthrow, as can be seen, for example, in the numbers of marches of the families with God for freedom that spread all over Brazil. I think that for the past 50 years, the 1964 coup d'etat was interpreted in a reduced way as a mere disturbed initiative of the military coup leaders which launched the dictatorship that might be explained by the tremendously negative impact of the military regime. What I'm trying to say is the following. In Brazil, a prevailing memory was formed according to which Brazilian society was a victim of the dictatorship. This is evidently not false, but as it seems obvious to me, it's a simplified reading insofar as it puts aside the support given by part of society to the coup and in some moments to the military regime itself. It is therefore a stereotype or myth extremely hard to deconstruct. Allow me now a brief digression on this point. The view some people have of Brazil is marked by some myths and stereotypes. My 
country is supposed to be not only immune to big natural disasters, such as earthquakes and hurricanes, but also fortunate for having great natural resources, for having a territory with continental dimension, dimensions, and for the singular traits of its people, cordial and optimistic. <laughs> and what's more, we are supposed to live in a racial democracy recognized as such by the Pacific relationship among races and we are supposed to have a history exempt from cruelty because the great political changes such as the independence and the adoption of the Republic are supposed to have happened without any bloodshed. Thus, the 1964 coup, as other important events in Brazilian political history, is supposed to have occurred without violence. <coughs> Myths have enormous power. They end up influencing people's attitudes, even when they are denied by facts. Nevertheless, it's not easy to talk about a history exempt from cruelty to the families, for example, of Jonas Barros, Ivan Aguiar, Ari Cunha, and La Bibi Abdush, who died on the 1st of April during the 1964 coup. Perhaps out of naiveness, some people measure violence by the number of deaths if there were few deaths on the day of the coup, it was not very violent. <laughs> what does this mean? Well, according to this reading, we would have our tradition of a history exempt from cruelty confirmed. There are also those who call attention to the fact that the overthrow of Goulart was easy because Besides not having caused great bloodshed, everything was solved with some, some phone calls. This is relatively true. In fact, Goulart fell easily. Few acts of violence were, were verified, and effect effectively, a lot of things were decided by telephone. <coughs> but this is a simplified reading. The brutality of the 1964 coup d'etat is evident in the blood of the people who died. It must be denounced not only by other forms of violence, including the ones of institutional nature, but also by the great number of arbitrary actions that swept the country in that beginning of April. It was not as accepted as the thesis of a battle of phony calls presupposes. The 1964 coup was not marked by banality. The thesis of an aseptic and banal coup is related to the persistence of the myth of a history exempt from cruelty and corroborates the reading according to which in the first years of the military regime, there had been no torture. This is really not true. Soon after the coup, several arbitrary actions took place, such as arrests without mandates, violent questionings, and torture. The coup, as it usually happens in this case, these cases, released a wave of, of arbitrariness. The myth of a history exempt from cruelty cover-ups cover -ups the pacifying version that in Brazil, the 1964 coup and the military dictatorship were not as violent as, for instance, its Argentinian counterparts. Some assert naively that in Brazil there was a dita branda, an expression hard to, to translate into English, something like a soft dictatorship. These simplistic versions are mind comforting, 
but they must be repelled because they do not translate the through as well as being violent. The coup also counted on the support of part of society, as I have already said. These two points are interrelated. For those who supported the overthrow of Goulart, it must, <coughs> sorry, it must be thusing to suppose that there was no violence. But there was both violence and support. The marshes of the families with God for freedom, as I have already mentioned, happened all over the country. Let me, at this point, sum up what I have tried to put forth so far before presenting another issue. When the coup is interpreted in a teleological way as the event that set off the military regime, we tend to see it as a terrible episode that fell over Brazilian society, which in fact is true, but we also tend to understand the society only from this point of view, that is, as victim. This approach make, makes it very difficult to understand the support given by part of that society. I also asserted that the 1964 coup is the key event in the recent history of Brazil, but it's only possible to foresee the signification if we accept the perspective I am advancing. I mean, the coup as a symptom of the Brazilian authoritarianism which has long living roots and marks our role history. I believe it's necessary to abandon, abandon the idea of victimization, both in relation to the coup and in relation to the military regime. Maybe you know that in this moment we have at work in Brazil a National Truth Commission in charge of investigating the violation of human rights uh, that happened at that time. What has been going on? The Commission has insisted on approaching only those, so to say, classic cases, which configure a victimization narrative. The society on one side and the military on the other. A perspective is similar to the idea of a confrontation between the good guys and the bad guys. It is exactly in this sense that I say that the perspective of victimization must be abandoned. We want to build a sophisticated historical interpretation if we persist in these simplifications as if the coup and the military regime, the latter at least in some moments, had not been supported somehow. This interpretation, marked by victimization, is defended mainly by the human rights militants. I don't think it is an illegitimate discourse, but that is only one aspect among many others, that make up the complex reality of the historical period we are considering. And yet, it's the prevailing discourse. It turns the confrontation that occurred between the guerrilla, the armed struggle, and the repression forces into the emblematic fact of the military regime. Well, we all know that in Brazil, the warfare actions of the left were relatively insignificant. Why then does this occur? To try to understand this phenomenon, I realized I had to resume the question of violence. Now look, I'm not referring here to the fact of whether there was violence or not during the coup and during the regime. Of course there was, contrary to what say those 
who defended the thesis of Gita Branda, as I have mentioned. I would like to refer at this point to the use of the notion of violence as an analytical key to the Brazilian military dictatorship. For us to understand the enthronement of the notion of violence as an analytical key to the Latin American regime, military regimes, we must compare what happened in the Argentinian dictatorship with what happened in the Brazilian case. The notion of violence is one of the main analytical keys for those dealing with Nazism, Latin American military dictatorships and genocides in the 20th century. Other traumatic events having, have been studied according to this point of reference, based on the analysis of the Second World War and the Holocaust as emblematic episodes. In this perspective, the last Argentinian military regime, an extremely violent one, has been used as a reference to analyze other Latin American military dictatorships, such as the one in Brazil, which, however, was less violent. Based on the discussion of these issues, I intend to argue all that although the Brazilian military dictatorship was also very repressive, the notion of frustration rather than violence is more adequate to its understanding. What I would like to highlight is that the perception of the Holocaust and the, as an index for the 20th century and the failure of enlightenment has turned it into a kind of a metaphor for other traumatic histories. To this extent, there would be something common, above all, among historical process in the aftermath of traumatic events in countries that experienced totalitarianism, military dictatorships, the apartheid in South Africa, the genocide policies in Rwanda, Bosnia, Kosovo, among others. After traumatic events, Historiography quite often assumes a condemnatory tone, a consequence of an un <coughs> understandable tendency. We all have to condemn evil. Many of us are urged to take a stand as historians in journalistic articles in which we express disinclination. On these occasions, the connection between history of the present and politics is manifested vehemently. However, when producing historic knowledge, the condemnation of evil is almost a truism. This ethical, moral, and political tendency, irresistible when we tackle the traumatic events of the 20th century, can compromise our practice. I hope that before the end of this talk, I can make my position clear, a position that does not disregard empathy for the victims of any violence, of course. But I understand that the political, ethical, and moral commitments surrounding the professional activity of historians dealing with violence should not cover up the need for historical distance, not in the sense of an objectivism with pretensions to neutrality, but take, taking into account an effort for objectivity that needs to be revalued. One of the risks of the above-mentioned tendency is uncritical adherence to generalizing discursive prefigurations that, in an effort to build narratives, 
related to the logic of violence not only overlook specificities and empirical evidence, but also produce naive and simplistic explanation. The explanatory scheme according to which violent regimes generate fear that leads to apathy of social movements and blocks unintended opposition is not uncommon. One example of this perspective might be found in authors who adopt the society of fear notion. For them, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay had fear-mongering regimes in the 1960-98 period, in which a culture of fear exists, a culture of fear. These interpretations <laughs> tend to privilege dichotomic views according to which societies of fear were formed above all by perpetrators and victims. In this type of analysis, there is no room to perceive the support provided by part of the society to the authoritarian regimes. The analysis of the armed struggle violence is also impaired as this analytical scheme views the leftist militants merely as victims. There was a lot of violence in Argentina's recent history and it would be impossible to understand it without taking into account that phenomenon. It's not my purpose to discuss it in detail, but to call attention to two aspects that make it distinctive when compared to Brazil's history. The great visibility of the military repression and the extensive practice of violence by the armed struggle. The Argentinian military repression did not try to hide itself. Even before he assumed power, when he was still commander-in-chief, of the armed forces in the government of Isabel Perón. General Jorge Rafael Videla publicly ensured that Argentina would be pacified even if it would cost many deaths. There were many aggressive manifestations by Argentinian military who not only publicly, publicly expressed their barbaric positions but also seemed to have wanted to give them broad visibility. Rather than hiding the repression, as was done in Brazil, the Argentinian military seemed convinced that they would get society to support the repression. During the military regime in Brazil, there was no such dynamic intensely marked by violence. The Brazilian military were not confronted by an active, active and violent leftist subversion when they staged the 1964 coup. There was only the risk of expanding popular achievements such as the agrarian reform. Also, there was no history of violence prior to the coup. Armed actions by guerrilla organizations were few and were soon controlled by repression. The repression in Brazil used the efficient and brutal mechanisms after 1968 through the decree known as Institutional Act No. 5, which not only launched a cleanup operation but also established complex systems to control society through censorship, espionage, political propaganda, and the fight against allegedly corrupt people. The Brazilian military tried in every way to hide the repression, and when confronted with evidence of torture, they affirmed it was an excess deviation by a few. Thus, 
Brazil's military regime was, above all, marked by those forms of control of society regarded as unprepared and subject to the actions of demagogic politicians. The main difference in the Brazilian case is one of scale. The modest dimension of the armed struggle and the smaller number of deaths by repression. However, it is not this macabre accounting that shows the inadequacy of using the notion of violence to analyze the Brazilian dictatorship. It is a matter of perception, of social experience. To a large extent, the censorship hid from society the repression against the armed struggle, seeking to conceal the violence in an attitude that marks the history of Brazil, deemed to be exempt from cruelty, exactly by those propagandists of the two authoritarian regimes that devastated the country in the 20th century, the Estado Novo and the military regime. Despite this difference, which do not signal merely an academic correction of a comparative nature, diverse circumstances led to the creation in Brazil of a prevailing memory of the dictatorship that shows as emblematic event the confrontation between the left-wing opposition and the repression, attributing to this confrontation a centrality that is far from being supported by empirical evidence. This began under the military regime in the period known as political opening, the long transitional process controlled by the military that was initiated in the government of General Geisel. With the toning down of censorship, former armed struggle militants were able to publish their memoirs, not surprising, portraying the issue of violence as a privileged topic in viewing themselves in a romanticized perspective. The crystallization of a binary interpretation of the Brazilian military dictatorship that elevate the issue of violence to an, to an analytical key and shows as protagonists the repression and the armed struggle and the order protests by the left had in the 1979 amnesty law a singular moment. Signed by the last general president, the law was preceded by a popular campaign initiated in 1975 that began with complaints by wives and mothers of political exiles. The campaign had a hopeful tone and spread throughout Brazil under the motto broad, general, and unrestricted amnesty. However, the military government viewed the issue from another perspective. In the context of the political opening, the amnesty should exempt the military from any responsibility, responsibility regarding the repression and should allow the return of political leaders who would create new parties, thus weakening the only opposition party active then, the Brazilian Democratic Movement. The draft legislative proposal was sent to, to the National Congress in 1979, and parliamentary negotiations resulted in a kind of pact where amnesty to political exiles would be granted in exchange for pardon for all crimes committed by the repression. During those negotiations, attempting not to aggravate the violence of the armed struggle, the parliamentarians consolidate the image of former leftist militants as heroic and romantic youths. Five years later, 
Still in the context of the very long democratic transition in Brazil, society was galvanized, galvanized by the huge popular campaign in favor of direct elections for the president of the republic. The slogans, direta já, which means in Portuguese, uh, direct elections now, in English, I'm sorry, ended up giving the name to the movement. It tried to confront Geisel's project of a slow, gradual, and safe opening, which, in addition to other preliminary stages, such as the reduction of censorship, the revocation of Institutional Act No. 5, and the amnesty in 1979, presupposed indirect election in 1984 of the first civilian president through an electoral college whose majority was made up of parliamentarians who supported the regime. In order to have direct elections, the National Congress had to pass a constitutional amendment. It was impossible to pass this amendment without the support of pro-government parliamentarians. After the end of the military regime, again unlike Argentina, Brazil experienced a period of silence during which no one talked about the dictatorship. Argentina has marked its break with the dictatorship through the Malvina, Malvinas Falklands War and the trial of the three military juntas in 1985. War and the trial of heads of state are among the most spectacular phenomena of political history. A break, a real break. It was different in Brazil as a kind of counterfeit of a rupture that never occurred, occurred, the political elite and the mass media promoted the existence of a new republic starting 1985. This new republic appropriated and gave new meanings to the symbols of the campaign for direct elections. It fed on the emotionalism resulting from the unexpected death of Tancredo Neves, the civilian president elected by the Electoral College who was not even able to take office that year. The country entered a kind of latency, 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 latency. But the absence of a real rupture in the beginning of a suspended phase did not lead to overcoming the past. Ten years had gone by when the first redressing measure were taken by measures were taken by the Brazilian government in 1995 through a committee that recognized the disappeared people as dead. Other measures would follow, such as the creation of an inter intergovernmental committee responsible for granting compensation to the military regime victims in 2001, and more recently, the installation of the National Through Commission. It was in this context of measures of the so-called transitional justice in Brazil that comparisons with Argentina started to be drawn mainly by human rights activists. In the if the military had been tried in Argentina, why could they not be punished in Brazil? In 2008, Brazil's Bar Association requested the Supreme Federal Court to exclude the pardon to the military from the 1979 amnesty law. When this petition was finally judged, the Supreme Court maintained the prevailing interpretation according to which the crimes committed by the repressive forces were also covered by the amnesty. This 
rekindled the criticism of the Brazilian transition and soon afterwards the creation of the National Through Commission without power to punish also led to comparisons with Argentina, always in view of the issue of trials for the military. The trauma of the brutal violence of the military regime marked the Argentinian transition. In the case of Brazil, the fundamental characteristics of the transition were the impunity and the frustration caused by the lack of trials to punish the military and the absence of a break with, this, with the past. This, so to speak, has made the transition inconclusive, a result of a compromise among political elites. It was this component of frustration that somehow stimulate initiatives of transitional justice in Brazil after the arrival of governments presided by persons who had fought against the dictatorship. Brazilian society does not show any great interest in this issue which is monitored mostly by human rights activists, thus reinforcing the confrontation between military repression and left-wing opposition, whether armed or not, as the emblematic event of the Brazilian military regime. As a consequence, the history of ordinary people is practically ignored. I'm about to finish. <laughs> you could be wondering at this point, <laughs> what after all I am trying to say? <clears throat> what is the relationship between the characteristics of the 1964 coup that I emphasize and the features that marked the Brazilian transition? I think that both processes are really connected. When the coup is interpreted only as the opening event of a brutal military regime, this prevents us from placing it in the long course of Brazilian authoritarianism. This would, this would free society from the burden of participation providing a margin for what I am calling a victimizing reading. Thus, in a coherent link with this reading after the end of the military regime, the interpretation that the civilians were all Democrats and were victims was established. They fought the authoritarian military. This simplification according to what I am proposing, stems to a great extent from the transformation of the Argentinian dictatorship and the Chilean too, into an emblematic case. The violence of the repression would be, would be the analytical key to all military roles. It does not seem to me that this <coughs> generalization is right. Overcoming the simplified and romanticizing readings seems to me essential for seeking adequate historical explanation. My dear colleagues, I have tried to bring you today some reflections about the 1964 coup at this moment when we mark the 50th anniversary of its occurrence. These anniversaries are always opportune to the extent that they foster rethinking history and questioning established interpretation. But I would like to conclude recollecting another anniversary. Precisely today, 
the 10th of April 1984, 30 years ago, exactly at the same time, there happened in the city of Rio de Janeiro the famous rally of Candelaria in the context of the Direta Já campaign. I was a young historian, <laughs> just graduated, and went to the rally, maybe because of some objectivism or pessimism. I heard the speeches of the opposition's politicians skeptically, certain that it would be very hard for us to get the constitutional amendment for legitimate elections for the first civilian president after the military regime passed. After some time, before the main speeches that were still to come, there came on the stage the frail and white-haired figure of liberal lawyer Sobral Pinto, then in his 90s. Although a Catholic, he had defended the communist leader Luis Carlos Prestes after the communist uprising 1935. He began his speech with a simple rhetorical sentence, quoting the first article of the Brazilian Constitution. All powers emanate from the people and ex exercise in their name. The crowd cheered wildly. I thought, the direct elections will not pass, but Brazil, from now on, is going to live times of great historical change. I do not know whether I was wrong. I hope not. I hope to be right in saying that Brazilian society does not accept, nor will it accept, authoritarian solutions for their problems anymore. Thank you very much for your <laughs> I would like to welcome you all, uh, to, uh, encourage you all to join us in the reception and, and, and call you back tomorrow at 8.30 for breakfast and the sessions beginning tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning.